you start to question your value. You start to question your self-worth. Like the more money you got, the more successful you are, and most people really do buy into that. But really, I just needed a break. What I love is helping people. I'm Julie Bauke, and welcome to The Evolved Career, a podcast where we help you determine what truly does matter most to you and how it can have a profound impact on your life. Today, we welcome Jill McBride, founder of Grown Up Dish. Dot com. It's a food and lifestyle blog for grown-ups, featuring real food, real talk, and real life. Welcome, Jill. Hi, Julie. Thanks for having me. Well, I am a subscriber to your blog, and you know our email boxes are crammed with so much stuff, and sometimes we sit and just go on an unsubscribe fest, and sometimes we just delete, 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 or blow past it. I will absolutely tell you... I'm not just blowing smoke up your skirt here. Your newsletter and your blog is a must read. Oh, that that made my day. That makes me feel amazing. I try I try really hard to provide information that's of value and not to send too much of it. So Yes. I'm, yes. I, 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 you know, my ultimate goal is for people to see it and go, oh, yeah, I got to check that out, out. If I can't do it right this minute, I'll do it later. Right. Exactly. So let's back up. You've done several things okay. before you got to the grown up dish. Traditionally, if people were to describe someone with your background, it's public relations, advertising um, have really been the, the playgrounds that you've operated on. Is that correct? Would you say that's accurate? I think that's totally accurate. The first, I'm going to say the first 10 years of my career right out of school, I worked in the advertising agency business. And then I started my own firm um, and ran it for 20 years. And out of that 20 year period, the first 10 years, it was just me working solo. I was a solopreneur. And then the last 10 years, I actually decided to build and grow and then ultimately sell a business. Um, So I've, I've kind of come full circle. And then, and then I decided to start growing up dish. Okay. So, so, when you think about your first years, uh, early career years, you're part of an agency and uh, you're looking around, what kind of stuff did you do? What what were your days filled with? That's a great question. Um, in the early years, I had my hands in a whole bunch of things. I it, it, People, I don't know if people know this, but in the agency business, you're, you can be either on the creative side or on the account side. So on the creative side, you're either usually a graphic designer or a copywriter. And, or you're on the account side and you're dealing more with clients. I actually did both. So early years, I tried to do as many different things as possible. One, because I was really interested in doing different things. And two, because I just really wanted to learn about what I liked and what made me happy and what I was good at. And was that hard to do? Like, did you, did you have a hard time getting people to allow you to do that? That's a great question. I, um, a little bit, but I was, at, I was at smaller agencies where people had to wear a lot of hats. So I think that they were grateful that I was willing to say, yeah, I'll manage this account. And you know what, if it's, you know, and and I can write the copy too, or, and I can work with the graphic designer to get this piece produced. My experience is the more I raised my hand and offered to do things, like it was very rare I got told no. Were you unusual? Uh, Were there others, your peers, you know, other people your age and stage in your career in the agencies you were in early on who also wanted to do that? Or or was that unusual to to have someone like you put their hand up and say, give me more, give me more? I think it was a little unusual that I didn't just pick a lane. But but yet, but but the second part of the question, there were certainly other people who were trying to do the same thing. I'm just great. You know, I'm just really grateful that I was in good places. I had good bosses. I had good mentors who really encouraged me to just learn as much as possible and to get involved in as many facets of the business as I could. When you think back to those early career years, was there a part of you that said, I want to do this for myself someday? No. Okay, great. (laughs) No. No, I I always told people, I always joked when I started my company that I, I backed into it in the biggest backdoor Freddy cat way possible. I, you know, all the things that I didn't do, I didn't have a business plan. I didn't set out to do this. I kind of, I kind of fell into it. I love that. And had I, ha, yeah, had I not fallen into it, I'm going to say I might not have been brave enough to do it. So the fact that 
you know, I was able to just, you know, people were, you know, people called me and said, can you do this project for me? And I was like, okay. And I would meet them with them and I would start doing the project. And, you know, I was probably six, eight months in where I was like, until, but I realized, oh, I think I'm like running a thing here. I probably need to go talk to my accountant and open a separate bank account. And like, like I was well into it before I realized that I was even doing it. Well, let's unwrap that because I think that if, if for our listeners, I think there's this idea or this misperception that business owners followed that path that we're always told you need to follow. Write a business plan. Right. Have that burning desire to be an entrepreneur. You know, uh, you know, and right. then you're going to do this and then you're going to do this. And for people who but the truth is people who own their own things, I think there's many more who backed into it in a scaredy cat way than most people realize. Absolutely. I had after like 10 years in the agency business, I was really burned out. And I was married at the time. My husband said, why don't you just take a little time off? And, I was, and my answer at the time was, well, I can't afford to take some time off. And he was like, I don't want you to be miserable. Just take some time off. You're going to figure out in short order what you want to do. So 10 days into my what was going to be, you know, I said in my head was going to be a year off, somebody called me and said, hey, I heard you were, you know, you left your, your other position and I've got this project. Can you help me with it? And I was like, oh, I'm taking a year off. And I was like, I'll just have coffee. So we went and talked, and I was like, yeah, this isn't going to take that much time. It's, you know, 10, 12 hours a week. Sure, I'll help you with this project. And I was literally off to the races from that moment. Like one project became two projects. Do yeah. you honestly think that you would have been able to take a year off? At, you know, at the time, I did. Okay. I, I really did. And, and that, that, that kind of was my intention. But I was, you know, I felt like you know, when I took this very first project – for the first two years, I was in kind of a part-time rhythm, and it really worked for me. I had kids, and, you know, young kids at the time, and, you know, I liked working 10 to 15 hours a week. I felt like I was still learning, still growing, still keeping my skills sharp, making some money, but, you know, I wasn't tied to that sort of agency 50-hour-a-week work week. You know, it's, it's as I'm, I'm listening to you talk, you know, this sort of uh, – let's call it what you called it, backdoor, frady cat yeah. way to get into I it. in. Do you think that is more of a female way to approach it? More women get into business ownership or running a business that way than men do? I don't know any data, but I would say anecdotally, probably yes. Although I feel like the younger generation, and I'm saying that in air quotes, but you know, I'm an old lady now, I'm 55. Yeah, I'm right with I, you. I feel like these, I feel like these, these youngsters now, like I look at my kids, like so many of them have a side hustle and their goal ultimately is to turn that side hustle into a job. So I know lots of, you know, younger folks, 20 something, 30 somethings that have kind of a traditional career path, but they've also got this side hustle thing going and ultimately they would love to flip it. You know, they'd like to spend their time and energy on their side hustle. Yeah. And I love the, I even, I love the use of the phrase flip it. I always say yeah. you've, got, you've got a bucket that may be pretty full of, or really full of your your core thing, but you're like, you know, there's something else I'd like to try, but I can't empty out bucket A and pour all into right. bucket B for a variety of reasons, some financial, some confidence, and all those other things. But the the side hustle allows you, and, and, and technology plays such a role in our ability to do this, allows us to start filling up bucket B to the point that yeah. we can test it to see if it's all we thought it was going to be for us from a satisfaction standpoint or and or B, whether it's really a thing that people are going to pay us to do. And imagine back in our day, right. Jill, back in the 80s when we were coming of age into the market, that whole concept would have been completely foreign to us. In fact, would have been thought to have been right. ridiculous. Right. And and we, we'd have probably been shamed if we tried it. Yes. Like we would have stepped, you know, so far out of the cultural norm that people would have said, oh, you know, she's not serious about her career. Yes. Because were you now, so back in the, 
eight back in the agency your early agency days, did you, like I did in my early career, have a collection of those silk floppy bow ties? Oh, the, the casual corner suit. <laughs> that was like I knew I had made it when I went to casual corner and bought like the matching jacket and skirt oh, with yeah. the pants and you know, and then you get the two blouses to go with it. Oh, yes. yeah. I have photos of that. Casual that corner. Yes. yes. The floppy bow ties. And then if you were super fancy, you got the little rosettes. I had quite a collection, I must yes. say. To this day, I don't like anything with a bow on it. I think that's why. <laughs> we're <Yeah>. scarred. <laughs> we have PTSD I'm around very, our floppy bow ties. I'm very anti bow. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I'm very anti bow. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I, I'm with you. It was, um, it was a scarring period of time. And it's one of those trends that I'm so glad hasn't come back. And I, I hope that this generation right. is smart enough not to bring it back. And so you you walked away. You said, I need a break. I was getting burnt out. Yeah, I was exhausted. I, I had two kids. Yeah, two kids in an agency job that was really, you know, those jobs are, they're, you're, they're client driven and they're, you know, they're 24 seven. Right. Just, it was just a lot. They don't care if you have kids or you're burnt out. They just need something done. They don't, oh, they yeah. Don't. So it's almost right, like, exactly. it, I think from, it seems like from a job like that, you almost have to rip the Band-Aid off the hairy arm completely uh, versus trying to just empty your bucket slowly. Right. Well, I just needed a break. I had gone from an account, like, like the lowest level at an agency, like whatever I got hired at, like an account coordinator to an SVP in like six or seven years. Wow. So, I mean, it was great because my income had tripled. Although even though my income had tripled, I wasn't keeping up with the men who came yep, in at a yeah. higher level, right? Because I started right. out at such a low salary. I knew I was going to have to leave to make more money. And, um, but really, I just needed a break. So, you know, I didn't know how long that break was going to be, but I thought it was going to be a year, but it turned out to be 10 days. So how, how far into your taking on project after project did you say this to yourself? Hey, maybe I really have something here. or Maybe I ought to get more serious about it. How long did that take? Yeah, I'm going to say within six months. Okay. I realized that because I mean, I just, you know, this project, one project kind of turned into another project. And within six months, first of all, I'd, I, you know, I had, got, I'd had to go out and buy a fax machine. And, you know, I'd ha- I had a computer at the time, but, you know, I needed stuff. And then within six months, I had a separate phone line. I was literally working in the basement of our house. So, like, I didn't even have, like, an office, you know, an office with a door in the house. Um, and within six months, I went and met with my accountant. And, you know, met, you know, talk to him about, you know, do I need to do anything legally? You know, what do I need to do? I think, I think I'm doing this. I think I paid somebody to do a logo. Like I was, I was off to the races in about six months. And, and did you find that now you're, it's six months is a fairly short period of time. Now you're working really hard again, but it was a different kind of work. What did that do to that burnout you were experiencing. Yeah, it was a hundred percent different kind of work. So first of all, at least initially for the first couple of years, it was only part time. Um, but I found that just being I'm a girl who needs a lot of control. Like I'm I own that. And and just being in more in control of what work I took on, when I did it, how I did it, like I I was having so much more fun. I had health issues that I had had for years. I mean, I had suffered from migraines. I never had another migraine after I stopped working for other people. So it, it was a huge shift. That's huge. Because I, I think that, that the, the, the takeaway there from that experience of yours is that you um, were fried. And so the only thing you knew how to do was get completely away from that. But as you look back, right. you were fried on what you were doing, the agency work. You weren't fried from working or you weren't fried from your profession. I love to work. But yeah. yeah I love to work. Yeah. And so uh, being able, I think what's so hard sometimes is we get in such a bad place with, I got to get out of here, that we never bother to sit back and actually diagnose what it is that's making us so crazy. And so therefore, when you don't know that, you don't know what direction to go or what to change. Or what to fix, exactly right. what to fix first. I sort of diagnosed it as it was happening, right? So as I started, you know, started down this path of being a solopreneur and I, you know, I, I realized, oh, I really like this and I really like working like this and I like the flexibility and I can drive my kids to football practice and work my work life around my home life. 
And so, so I kind of figured out as I was doing it what worked for me and what didn't work for me. Now, I, I mentioned earlier, like I did this, I did this on my own for almost 10 years. Um, but that 10 years was also kind of a big evolution because what ended up happening was I got busier and busier and I quickly got to a fork in the road. I was in the same place. I got myself right back to the same place. <laughs> yeah. So that control, Surprise. you got how, the control, you do that? Oh, right. Yeah. You got your control, then you lost your control. It, I got too busy. I got, I got to the point where I couldn't take a vacation. I couldn't control my schedule anymore. I was working too many hours. I was, same thing, I was exhausted. And I was also tapped out on income. I couldn't push any more work through my one body. It was physically impossible. So my options at that point were I could raise my rate or I was going to have to get some help. Like I, those were the only two paths. Right. And so you did what? I got an intern and I was terrified. I was still working. We had moved houses. So I had an office in, my, in our house with a door. But um, I hired a student to come in and work with me, a marketing student, and I, and I was scared to death. I, I don't know why. It wasn't, it wasn't going to be that much money, but just the idea that I had like a payroll, you know, <laughs> I wasn't just going to eat what I killed. Yeah. Like I was scared to death. But if I didn't do it, I was getting to the point where I was going to start losing business because I wasn't servicing my clients the way I knew they needed to be serviced. I just, I didn't have enough time. I don't like to half-ass things. So sometimes I think about like, the first client I ever had, and I always feel like I should find him and apologize to him, you know, because you think, <laughs> no, I just no. learned so much. Do yeah. you ever feel like you should find that intern and apologize to mm. her? <laughs> oh, no, no. <laughs> I think it was, I, honestly, it was a great experience for both of us. We're still in touch. Like, we're still buds. She's actually gone on and been quite successful. And when I owned my agency, they came in and talked to us. Like, we almost did some work for them. We didn't oh, my gosh. It, wow. No, no. I, no. But anyway, I had her, she, and I think, I want to say she and I were together. It was the kind of the dynamic duo for like, for probably about a year. And, and I mean, like we were, to, we, we shared a desk. Wow. She sat at my desk. I'm, I like a little return, you know, she sat at my desk with her laptop. I made us lunch every day. Like we, we were. Wow. I want to we work for you. For that year. Yeah, for that whole year. And it, the, by the end of that year, I was like, I need another person. And at that point, my husband said, you need to go get an office. <laughs> yeah, get out of the house. How many people are we going to have right, at our house exactly. <laughs> every single day? Right, right, like, right, exactly. That, that, you know, that he had to go make chicken salad for lunch for us. So, and, and again, I was absolutely scared to death. Scared, to, like, I remember my first, my rent for my first office space was like $600 a month. And that to me was like, that was, that was so much money. Yeah. So I, 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 I signed a lease and I rented this crappy little office above a bowling, next to a bowling alley. So bowling alley. And there you go. Yeah. 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 And it had, I'm trying to remember, it had a little reception area. I want to say it had, I think I had my office and two other little, like teeny little cubby hole offices. And that was my first, that was my first office. So I, it was me and the intern and then I hired my first employee. How big did you get? 12 people. Wow. Yeah. Hopefully you got more comfortable with <laughs> adding over time. Like when you added that 10th, 11th, and 12th person. I got really comfortable. Yeah. Yeah. I got really comfortable. Because I figured, well, I figured out as soon as I made the leap to just get out of the house and like get serious and do this, when, right after I hired my first employee, things took off. And I, you know, I, I figured out in short order that this was the path to growing revenue was, oh, yeah, I didn't have to do everything myself. I could focus on the things I like to do and the things I was really good at, and I could hire people to do things that they were good at, and I was off to the races. In, like, 18 months, we had outgrown that office. I had to move again. And you said, you said, I'm control girl, and I own it. So with 12 people, you certainly can't operate as a sole Jill's going to do everything anymore. What was that like for you, relinquishing oh, no. control? Or did you ever do it successfully? Yeah, it, it has, <laughs> oh, no, I did do it. I did do it. It was not, it actually wasn't as hard as I thought it was going to be. By the end, before I sold my company, when we were sort of at our peak, we, so we'd moved downtown, we had about 12 people. 
I had I had a second in command um, that was that was my COO, and and at that point she man I kept our largest client, and I worked on new business, and those things were directly under my control. And I and I you know did all the agency functions, you know the payroll and the marketing and all of that. But then my number two person, she ran all of our other accounts, and I, that was the best. It was great. Yeah. What was the moment in which you said, I'm done? I need to close my doors and move on to the next part of my life. It didn't happen in a moment. It definitely didn't happen in a moment. But as, so, so like I said, the first 10 years I was on my own, the second 10 years I was building this company. And, you know, we went up, tick, 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 you know, until we got to, you know, a pretty, a pretty decent size small agency. I mean, we were never huge, but, you know, a couple million dollars a year in revenue and 12 people. And I was 50. And I, then I started just to think about, okay, well, now I'm in it. But how am I, what, how am I ever going to get out of this? You know, I didn't, my kids weren't interested in coming into the business, nor were they particularly qualified to do this. I mean, it just wasn't their skill set. Plus, I, I have a problem, a little problem with that anyway. Like, I feel like people need to kind of earn their place. So, um, so I just started thinking about, okay, well, now I'm in it. How do I get out of it? And I looked, I, you know, I, I kind of explored options for a long time. I looked at, an, I think it's called an ESOP, where you mm -hmm. sell it back to your employees. Right. Yes. I looked at that. I, mean, I wasn't quite big enough for that. Um, I, looked at, I looked at the pros and cons of, at some point, just shutting it down but decided not to do that because I was, there, were, there were kind of three goals I had. I wanted to take care of my employees, who I love, like family. I wanted to take care of my clients, who I also loved. And I wanted, you know, some kind of compensation for the 20 years I had put in. So those were the three goals. And if I shut the business down, I wasn't going to accomplish any of those things. So I started looking at options. Did I merge with somebody? Did I sell? Did I... Um, you know, my first choice was to sell it to my number two person. And I tried to do that. She just didn't want it. Mm -hmm. So that would have been the easiest and best path. And I was excited because I thought that was going to happen, but then it didn't. And then I, so then, you know, over a period of really multiple years, I got pretty far down the road with a couple of potential buyers. Some approached me, some I approached, um, but the deal never felt completely right. And I almost did a deal at one point um, with, with, with another agency, which would have been, that was smaller than ours, that wanted to buy us. But we got right down to the brass tax and financials. They wanted me to cut people, like right out of the gate. And I was like, it's come on my people. And I was like, no, I'm not going to do that. Like that's a commitment I made to folks when they came to work for me, was that I was going to do everything possible to be, I always wanted to be a stable agency. I didn't want to be one of those, Agencies that just gets a big account, hires a bunch of people, loses a piece of business, fires a bunch of people. Like that isn't the way I ever wanted to work and it isn't the environment I wanted to create. So anyway, ultimately, long story long, I sold in 2016 okay. to a larger agency. So what was that? Yeah. What was that? Um, you know, the first day after it wasn't yours anymore. It's hard. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we literally, we closed on like June 30th, and on like the July 2nd, I reported for work in a new office. And I sat in a cube. <laughs> How and... long did that last? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, it lasted as long as it needed to last. I mean, I was, I was to stay through the transition, and I stayed through the transition. And I was prepared for that. Like, I knew I was going to do that, and I was prepared to do that and happy to do that. And all I was really focused on was making sure that my – team was taken care of and that our clients were taken care of. Like I wanted this, I wanted both my team and my clients to see this as a good thing, not a bad thing. I wanted it to be good for them. Yeah. And so you, you here you are sitting at a desk and someone else is running the show and you're trying to take care of your clients and your people. What was going through your mind about what Jill was going to do next? Once you lost that identity, you you're you're not going to sit at home and and you know you're just, no. I know you're not going to sit at home and watch TV. How much thought had you given to what your next act was going to be? I had actually given it a bit of thought, quite a bit of thought, because because otherwise I didn't have to do it. I was under no pressure to sell what I sold, 
You know what I mean? I could have run it indefinitely. I could have run it for another five years. I could have run it for another 10 years. So I was really under no pressure. So I, before I decided to sell, I gave a, a lot of thought, and I knew I wanted to do something else. I didn't know what it was yet. I also knew I wanted to move. Okay. So, you know, I had been, I was in the mid, I was in the Midwest. I had been there for a long time. My kids were grown. My kids were out of college. They weren't coming back. And while there was nothing wrong with the city that I was in, I was just ready to go somewhere and do something else. And so you knew you wanted to do something else. You didn't know where it was. You knew you wanted to move someplace else, but you weren't sure where it was yet. Correct. Okay. Then what? And like, and like a lot of, like a lot of things, I believe when you're, clear on your intention, the universe just swoops in and hands you things and supports you. And so I, I was in a newer relationship and I had gotten divorced and I, you know, was dating somebody and he also was at a bit of a career uh, crossroads after 25 years at the same company. And, you know, he and I were talking and I was like, I think I'm going to sell my company. And once I work through this earn out period, I'm going to be free to go. And, you know, I think I want to go somewhere else. And within a really short period of time, he kind of walked in one night and said, hey, I just got a call from a headhunter. There's a job in Denver. You want, you know, should I look at it? You want to go to Denver? And I was like, I've never been to Denver. I might want to go to Denver. (laughs) And it was literally, it was literally that casual. Oh my gosh. So I was like, sure, interview with them, see what happens. And then he got the, you know, he landed the job. He got the job offer. We flew across the country, spent a one weekend in Denver in January. Oh my. You know, and, and I was like, well, if I don't hate it in January, I'm sure not going to hate it in the summer. And we came back, he accepted the job. We sold the house. And we were here within a couple months. Wow. So it, it was, you know, everything just kind of fell into place. Right. So one of your big questions was answered. Then how did you, where did right. the, where'd the grown-up dish come from? So after we moved, you know, after you kind of get through the hassle and all the unpacking and the, you know, the, like moving is an in, in and of itself is a job. So I was in a new city. I didn't know a soul. I didn't have the 25 years of work and friend connections that I had, you know, where I lived before. And I was like, what am I going to do with myself all day? You know, like he was off working and I was in a brand new city. So, you know, I spent a little time exploring the city and then I just really started to think about, well, how do I want to spend my time and what am I interested in doing? And, you know, what, what's next for me? So I did spend a good bit of time, you know, thinking about that and kind of kicking around some ideas. Did I want to buy another company? No. Did I want to manage people again? No. So I, you know, I was able to kind of tick some things off that I didn't want to do. Did I want to write a book? Eh, Maybe, but a lot of work. I've done that. I've done that for clients. It's hard. Um, But I started looking around and I was spending a good bit of time on social media because I wasn't working. And I realized, (laughs) I was like, there's so many bloggers and influencers out there and they're all most of them are like our mommy bloggers like they're all childbearing age you know 20s 30s and I was like where are the grown-ups where are where are the women are my age like they're they're online but who's talking to them who's paying attention to them who's talking about the things that they care about and I thought well maybe I'll try to do that and you know, I know how to do a bunch of things from all my time in the agency world. I will say I didn't used to do all of those things myself. <laughs> yeah, there's probably so. some, some fun learning going on. Some cussing. Oh, big time <laughs> learning. Yeah. Yes. Yes, exactly. Exactly. So anyway, I decided to start this to start this property, to start this brand, Grown Up Dish. And I started it in May twenty eighteen. It's when I launched. Well, how long? How long from idea to launch? Yeah, three months. Three months. Okay. Lots of research. Yeah. Lots. I, of... I work at. I, well, I work at. Well, I work at agency speed. Still, I can't. It's help true. Them. That's right. So, That's right. Like I. Yeah, I really do. I work fast. So it was like I decided to do it, and then it was like, okay, what am I going to call this thing? Brainstorm names. Blah blah blah. Send an email to a bunch of friends. Said, which of these names do you like? you know, hired a graphic designer that I worked with before. Can you make me a logo? My kid's a web developer. You know, this is, it isn't what he wanted to do, but I'm like, you're going to build mama a website. That's right. <laughs> Here's what I need. Or else. Right. 
I, I birthed you. You can do this. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Spec it all out. So I was off to the races like really fast. Yeah. What I love about it is when I first started getting it, I was like, this is a beautiful culmination of everything, not only your professional skills, but also as a 50-some-year-old woman, it brought in your life experiences and your life interests and combined them with your professional skills. And that, to me, is a truly evolved career. And you were living in a space where you were truly interested in it. And it, it really, to oh, me... I'm, ha- I'm having oh, so much fun. I can tell. Yeah, it's I mean, most, it's, it's... It's the most fun thing I've ever done. It's yeah. fun to see the infusion of your background, your PR and marketing and advertising background, how you infuse all of that into lifestyle topics. And so tell us, what kind of things do you cover on The Grown Up Dish? Well, my goal was to focus on helping other grownups. And by the way, I let whoever's, I let my readers decide what that word means to them. (laughs) I love that. Yeah. Some 30 year olds, some 30 year olds are grownups and some 75 year olds are not. Love so that. Love you that. You get to decide yes. what, what, right, what that, what that word means to you. But, um, but I really wanted to just help people and be of service and help them live kind of healthy, happy, fulfilled lives and to age gracefully. So, so it's a, I do a little bit of food, uh, you know, food and healthy recipe stuff, and some recipes that are not healthy, like treats and stuff. But I try, I try to, we try to stay pretty clean in our own diet. So I try to clean up, you know, other, other recipes um, and share them. Um, Book reviews, movie reviews, product reviews. Um, It's been interesting, you know, as I, because I've been just kind of feeling my way through this content and seeing what resonates. And sometimes it's really surprising what people are interested in. What, what what have you been most surprised about in, in this blog, in, in this endeavor? Yeah. I will say I've been most well, a little bit surprised, although when I put my marketing hat on, not surprised. So I thought that food was going to be the biggest piece of it, but there are so many food bloggers, and mm-hmm. it is very hard to stand out. And I'm good, but I'm not great. Like I know, so where where I find that I'm getting the most traction and the most interest is more on the product sharing side. You know, people are interested in. How do you? How do we all live a greener, cleaner lifestyle? People, women are interested in like, what's the best sports bra? Um, you know, what's the best, you know, electric toothbrush? So those kind of comparison posts where I'm going out and I'm trying a bunch of things yeah. and I'm really just sharing my opinion of what I liked and what I didn't like. Those those kind of posts seem to hit a nerve and do really well. Well, you're saving us time, frankly. I mean, you're going out and doing the hard work. Well, and, and there's nothing that I value more than the opinion of a trusted girlfriend. Right. Exactly. So if I, if I have a girlfriend and I know that she, you know, no bullshit, she's going to tell me the truth if something is good or not trying to sell me something, you know, does, does it work? Does it not work? Do you like it? Do you not like it? That's gold to me. And I was already doing this with my girlfriends, right? Every time I saw a good movie, I was sending out a text. Every time I read a great book, I was sending out a text. I was already doing this. So the, the, the grown up dish was just kind of an opportunity for me to just institutionalize it and give it a place to live. Wow. Love that. Is there anything about this blog or this project that you thought you'd really love, but you look at and go, meh, I don't like it so much. Maybe I'll do less of that. Any surprises just from a, your personal preference standpoint versus your readers? Yep. I, well, I'll share with you that I am very uncomfortable being on camera. I spent my whole career being behind the scenes and I was a publicist. My clients were front and center. Nobody, you know, I, I would pitch them and I would sell them and then I would get out of the way and they would do their thing. So being the one that is on, that it's my face, like it has taken me so long and I'm still not completely comfortable with like to do Instagram stories. And I've had to just, really get over it. Like if I wait until I have a day where my hair looks good, <laughs> you know, my hair looks yeah, dirty, yeah, yeah. I'm wearing, if I wait for all the stars to align, I'll never get anything done. So I've really had to just bite the bullet and say, okay, I'm doing this today. And I look like I look like, 
and I don't have a stylist and a professional makeup team. I'm literally holding my phone. I'm uncomfortable with it, though, because in the agency world, you know, those things look natural, but they're not. Right. They're yes. very scripted. Yes. And, and there's somebody standing there making sure that you don't have, you know, an eyelash on your face and that you're not shiny. And I don't have anybody to do yeah. any of those things. So, um, so that's, been, that's, been a, that's been an adjustment for me, and I'm really still working through it. Um, the other thing is I don't love the photography slash videography piece of this. Um, it's just because I'm not good at it because okay. I'm not a professional photographer. Okay. So then my next thing is, is as soon as I feel like I can justify it, I'm going to get an intern. <laughs> Yay, I'm back to the interns. The come in. <laughs> yeah, it's back to the, I know, full circle again. I'm going to find somebody to come in a couple days a week who, who wants to sit and edit videos all day because that's not what I want to do. And, and I think that I will, will ultimately – once, I mean, I just, it's just a matter of just finding the right person and biting the bullet and doing it. But ultimately, I'm going to end up with a better product, and I'm going to spend my time on sort of the higher value work and the places that I, the things that I'm good at, and they can spend their time, you know, cleaning up photos and editing videos, which I can do, but I just don't like to do. It's, I'm sitting here laughing because it's so interesting that, you know, it's like, it's another it's another cycle that's so similar to exactly what you went through when I you know. started your business but this one and this is what is so critical about evolving your career this cycle fits with the life with your life right now where that cycle fit with your life back then oh absolutely and and the other thing you know I would share is that you know I think people so I think people sort of looking from the outside, they see things like this and they think, oh, well, she was never scared. She was never worried. Oh, I'm scared all over again. I'm scared all over again. I don't want to, I don't want to do a bad job. I don't want to look like an idiot. I don't want to fail. Um, whatever, whatever that would look like. Um, you know, I want this to be, uh, to be successful, you know, not at this point in my life, it's less about monetary success and it's my success. My measure of success is that I'm useful and that I'm finding the right tribe and that my content is resonating with people. So if those things happen, the financial piece will fall into place. And how your definition of success has changed, and you're very aware right. of it, and you're able to articulate it. And I think we can get so caught up in the to-do list and the just running from one thing to the next that we never really stop and say, if this is successful, how will I know? What will it look like? What will it smell like? And getting really clear right. on that. And that that's, it's such a critical question, but we, it's one that's, it's a hard question. So we want to skip it and just stay in action. Well, and it changed. I mean, I'm in a place of real privilege right now because I mean, we all need money. I want to make money. I haven't made any money on this. Well, I haven't made any money. I've only spent money, but I'll make money eventually. But I'm in a real place I feel I'm of gratitude and privilege because I I can spend a little money on this until I get up and running. I mean, it's only been a year. So unlike other businesses that I start, started that were profitable from day one, I knew this was going to be a, a slow slog because I've built things like this for clients and I know how hard it is and how long it takes. Yeah. It's funny though, when it's you, you're like, oh yeah, oh yeah, it, it takes a, uh, it's oh, going to well, take this. It always takes twice well, as long as you think it will, even if you know better. Oh, Oh, I know. And I want to, and I want to do it right. I want to do it organically. I'm not going to go out and buy a bunch of followers. Like it's, I don't think that's, so I'm going to do it right. And it just takes time. And you know, when I talk to friends of mine and I say, well, how big are you now? And I give them numbers. They're like, oh, that's great. And I'm like, it feels really small to me because I was used to working with clients with big budgets. And if you throw enough marketing resources at something, you will get to scale quite quickly. But I didn't, you know, I don't, I'm, I'm not able to do that. Um, you know, I don't have an unlimited marketing budget or deep, deep marketing pockets. So I'm just sort of plugging along and, you know, my growth is organic, but it's steady and my numbers are good. I'm at 50% year to date and I'll, I'll get there. It's just going to take a little longer. Yeah, but you've got a whole different perspective on life now too. You're not in that gut, your go, go thirties, oh. you know, you're just, you're just, you're right. stopping and smelling those roses along the way, which is, I think that, I think, I really do think that shows in how you're, 
how your blog um, is laid out and the content and just the whole vibe of it. I think it's uh, very relevant um, for grownups, regardless of, of age. And my, my goal, I mean, one of my goals was to be able to do this and not drive myself crazy because I'm kind of a type A go-getter. And that was a challenge that I kind of threw down to myself is, can I do this but not be nuts about it? and not feel like I have to work every weekend and every night and, you know, never take a vacation. Can, can I do it in a different way? And it, it's hard for me. It makes me uncomfortable. I mean, at first I was like, if I, you know, if I went away for a week, I was like, oh, I have to get ahead and I have to get all this stuff loaded and get posted. And now I'm not going to do, I'm not doing that. I'm yeah. like, I'm going to, if I go away for a week, the world's not going to stop turning. Nobody's sitting at home going, I didn't get my fill in the blank post today. So, I'm trying to just approach it with a different with a different mindset and to give myself a little grace until I until and unless I mean if I get to the point that this is really a monetized business, you know, and I have you know, brands and things that I'm accountable for, of course I'm obviously going to fulfill those obligations, but I'm trying to not drive myself crazy. Fantastic. So, are you ready to play two questions, one deep and one shallow? Oh yeah, I love a game. Okay. All right, so let's ask the shallow one first. What's a food you've never been able to eat that most people like? Food I've never been able to Bananas. Okay. I don't like bananas. No. None of my recipes have bananas. <laughs> I hate oh. a banana. Okay. <laughs> good. That's good to know. I'll, I'll not look for your banana bread recipe yeah. in your future newsletters. I thought, I thought about, I know, I thought about calling my site like banana list something. <laughs> but anyway, decided to go for something a little more universal. Yes, so. yes, yes. You don't want to insult the banana lovers in your tribe. All right, so here's my final Absolutely. question. The typical life expectancy of an American these days is 78.7 years. So you can do the math and think about how many years you have left on average. Ooh. So someday when you're gone, so bring. Yeah. I know it is. Someday when you're gone and people are talking about you, how do you hope they'll complete this sentence? The most profound impact Jill McBride made in her life was what? That she lived a big exciting life and that she inspired me to do the same and that she helped a lot of people along the way. Fantastic. Well, so how can we learn more? How can we get on your list? If you've got, we get some listeners here, I'm sure her dying to, to um, read your dish and most of them are probably grown ups. Yep. I am everywhere as grown up dish. So the website is www.grownupdish, all one word.com. I'm grown up dish on Facebook. I'm grown up underscore dish on Instagram because somebody had grown up dish was squatting on it. Um, so, so yeah, just look, just look me up. Um, I would say, I mean, if you go to the blog, there'll be a pop-up. You can sign up for the newsletter. Um, one of the better things to do though, is just follow me on Facebook or on Instagram because I, I uh, cross post socially all of the posts that I do. Plus there's a bunch of other stuff, random stuff that I share. So there's Great. content every single day. Well, thank you so much for sharing your career story. I think you've done so many interesting things, and I love how your career has evolved as your life has evolved, which I think is I think that's the key to maximizing this whole big uh, time we have on the planet. So if you're listening and you want some grown-up dish in your life, I'm here to tell you, you will not regret it. So Jill, thank you for sharing your journey from young public relations professional wearing a casual corner suit to the owner of Grown Up Dish. We appreciate your time. Thanks, Julie. Thanks for having me. It was a pleasure. If you enjoyed meeting the evolved careerist on today's episode, well, we've got a lot more lined up for you. Subscribe, tell your friends, rate us and write a review. And of course, follow us on social media. But if you're interested in learning more about how you can evolve your career, can contact us through theevolvedcareer.com or thebaukegroup.com, and that's B-A-U-K-E. Do you know somebody who'd be a great guest, who has a great career story to tell, or do you think you qualify? Then email me. My email address is in the podcast description. Until next time, here's to your career happiness. <laughs>